and welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Olivia Frico, Senior Content Producer and Editor of the Booktopian blog, and joining me today is our Fiction Category Manager, Ben Hunter. Hi, Ben. Hey, Liv. Uh, so, we didn't have to go very far today to find our author podcast guest, and that's because he's usually the person who's producing them. Here with us today to chat about the re-release of his debut novel, When Men Cry, is Booktopia's very own social media specialist, Nick Wazilyev. Welcome, Nick. This is a bit weird, being on I the other know. side, being the interviewer. I've been used to just being the man behind the scenes, being the little demon who records the stuff. The but little demon. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. It's great. It's great to see you already um, glowing red with a big uh, cheesy <laughs> grin. So uh, let's see if we can keep that up. Uh, Nick, do you want to tell us about When Men Cry? You, you, you're very young for a novelist, so I'm assuming writing came into your life very early. Yes. So I grew up in a family of kind of journalists. My father is a published writer. My mother is a published writer. Um, and so I always just grew up with books around me. Um, when Men Cry, uh, it tells the story of four men uh, reuniting for a night out in Sydney. This is kind of early 2020 Sydney set a year or so from now. Um, and they're reuniting their, their university friends and they're getting together to have a, to have a drink. But as the night goes on, it becomes very clear that one of them is dealing with a whole bunch of other issues and other things uh, with, uh, that are clearly just bubbling under the surface. And the inability of the others, other people, the other th people in this friendship to speak to about him and just ask those simple questions uh, essentially creates a huge ripple effect that extends beyond the context of their friendship. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? These these guys that um, <laughs> that they they they're wonderfully um, privileged dudes. They're like <laughs> North Shore um, white guys that have names like Jock. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they've got this the world is their oyster you know is the classic phrase kind of thing uh, and they've all gone to UCID or, or, or one of the uh, big sandstone universities um, and they're all mates and they're all hard drinking guys and uh, they they love each other but they've got no language they've got no, mm -hmm. no way of sharing what their problems are <laughs> that's this key frustration that that just drives this whole novel into insanity. Uh, is is that is that something that you've you've faced in your personal life that has driven you to write about this? Yes. So this uh, actually began as a short story during my own university times, and <clears throat> around this time. I was, you know, at university, I'm originally from the country, but, um, and I was staying in college on campus and these events would just happen all the time. You'd have people going out and getting drunk and, 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 and going out and gambling a huge amount. One of the, one of the stories which kind of originally came up in the, in one of the first drafts was someone, they, they, one like a real big gambler and then one one weekend they they had a really great round and then they said oh i'm off to bali for five days because i won all of these i got i've just won a couple of a couple of you know 30 30 40 grand i can afford that it, it's, it was a regular occurrence um and so this story which this short story that i wrote um while i was doing that university just came out of it just kind of a, came out of this situation and i had these four characters which was the framing for it um, and when I presented this short story, the unanimous response was, there's so much more to this. There's so much more that you can do with these characters. Um, and it wasn't very hard to draw from because this was the space that uh, the story is about growing up. The story is about that being able to have that uh, maturity and kind of, like you say, talk, actually develop the emotional maturity to be able to ask actually really simple questions um, and be honest about the whole notion of honesty um so it was yeah it was not very hard to pull from uh, that mm. space and, and chris the 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 voice the the narrator character of this novel the protagonist uh you, you see yourself as in chris's shoes <laughs> 
this is actually a conversation that I have with my friends all the time. So the unanimous question that they all ask is, which person am I? Uh, yeah, whenever right. we, which it's, it's a regular occurrence. A lot of people go gravitate towards jock. Um, they kind of see that larrikin sweep under the carpet <laughs> mentality. I, mm. these characters all came from different parts of me. I see, you know, I, if you were to point a gun at me, I kind of think I see myself as a bit more of a Noah. I'm a bit of a, I'm actually quite a sensitive guy, but <laughs> I do know there are parts of, of jock in me all the time. There are parts of Logan in me all the time and definitely mm. kind of, Chris as well, because Chris is kind of absorbing this whole situation. He kind of is going with the flow for a lot of the story. Um, and Chris seems to be a bit of an outlier, like in terms of his own socioeconomic position. Like you mentioned that he lives in this flat with his mum. It's got like a popcorn ceiling. Um, the decor is really like, it hasn't changed for about 20 years. And it's interesting how that kind of bleeds into his um, social life and also his romantic life later because He's just feeling very trapped and he can't quite articulate what it is um, that he feels trapped about until like a certain point in the novel. I won't go into spoilers or anything, but um, I do find it, I do like that Chris is the narrator because he's a little bit different from everyone else. Was that intentional? Yes. So Chris, of surprisingly, of all the characters, Chris was one of the hardest to actually put together um, because he he kind of emerged, he kept, while the other characters were very... Um, they started out in this short story very defined. Mm. You have Noah, who's the very sensitive type. You have Logan, who's kind of, you know, came from a military family, a military background with his family. Um, you have Jock, which is kind of fits more within the stereotype of the Aussie larrikin, you know, early 20-something bloke. Um, but Chris kind of emerged through the actual writing process, through the actual storytelling process. Um, how he kind of turned out he originally he was just viewed as the as this narrator character but he actually became probably one of the most interesting characters to write as the story progressed just because of the the details and everything that you could throw into into that character and the unique positions he could bring to a situation because i mean fundamentally at the end of the story it's a story about him growing up as well and learning mm because he is so restricted and you know it takes the influence of his partner and his his mother and the 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 guidance they often provide um mm. can actually really kind of is a, is a major driving force for him in terms of his growth but also from the actual struggles of being able to speak to his mates about the simplest things yes chris, mm. chris has this um this classic um a journey of, of the heterosexual male <laughs> that I see all the time is that where, where the mother leaves off um, raising the son, the, 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 um, the partner then just picks up the slack. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and it's just like the guy just expects it. <laughs> yeah. And, and this might be a good time to actually talk about the whole notion of gender in the story because yeah. the, the, the female characters are, are incredibly important. To, um, to, in terms of this story because um, and, and this again talking on like the, the, the subjects of mental health um, so I did a huge amount of research around mental health because if you are going to to talk about these subjects and this subject matter you really have to get it right um, and one of these really interesting you know articles and, and research pieces that I found was talking about how partners uh, respond when men, when their partner cries in front of them. So a whole bunch of girlfriends and wives were asked this question of, um, of what, how do you respond or how do you feel when your partner actually is emotional and cries in front of you? Um, and a lot of them said that they feel privileged. And that actually kind of angered me a little bit mm. because it, it basically said to me that the men in man the, always getting angry, the men in this, well, I know, I feel, <laughs> but it made, it made me realize that the men in this, that the men in these relationships don't feel comfortable with being vulnerable in front of their partners. And as, ex, and by extension, the, they, the, so many partners have to pick up the slack on that. 
Um, whereas women, particularly around, I mean, of course, women themselves have struggled with huge amounts of their mental health. Um, there's a, societal expectations. I do not even get started. Um, but there's their ability to actually be open is something that men really need to learn a lot from um, because men have a terrible tendency to really bottle up and not even be vulnerable with themselves. Um, and mm -hmm. the fact that Louise has to pick up the slack shouldn't be the case, which sucks in, in, in the, in the context of that relationship, but it was in something that had to be addressed because it, it, I see it all the time um, within, you know, particular relationships. Yeah, and it was interesting how when she is trying to push him, push Chris to, you know, find out what's wrong with Logan, reach out to people and, I don't know, her suggestions seem so, like, common sense, but just mm. the fact that they induce this weird reaction in Chris of, like, oh, I can't, like, simultaneously feeling, like, not good enough because he couldn't reach out to his friends, but also irritated because, you know, like, oh, you're so perfect and, like you know, you've got it all figured out. And it's like, no, this is just basic mm. human vulnerability, you know? And the fact that it does induce that reaction is very telling, I think. Yeah, and there's, there's, um, there's this, uh, yeah, this has been my experience as, as, a, as a young man, is uh, there's this real disconnect of mateship from, like, the value of that. Like, you, you understand that, these these guys around you are precious but you have this feeling that they're only there because of context and so when high school ends or when undergrad ends and the, you're not living together you're not playing footy together whatever it is anymore mm. um there's 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 no recourse to connect on any deeper level um and you just you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs waiting for the next boys night and when you have that boys' night and it all goes to shit, you just you throw up your hands and go, well, why? I don't understand. Uh, there must be something wrong with me or there must be something wrong with these people, but I don't know what it is and I don't have a... Again, I don't have a language to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And a lot of this book is huge, is about what is said, but also what is not said. Um, mm. And honesty was kind of the key theme that was driving this book, not just around uh, honesty with your partner, honesty with your, your mates, but especially honesty with yourself. Mm. Um, you know, Chris is, I mean, particularly for in the case of Logan, uh, Logan face, struggles with honesty throughout this entire book. Um, mm. Noah often, whenever, when shit is hitting the fan, he takes the approach of, well, this is the, itch, this is the situation. And this is the way, um, the, uh, this is the one single problem. And this mm. is how we need to address it without actually stopping to think, uh, well, why is these events happening the way they are? And Jock is very much a sweep under the carpet, kind of blow. Mm. And Chris is still trying to figure out how to even process all of this stuff. So for me, honesty was being honest with yourself, being honest with your friends, being honest with the people around you was kind of the key message that was wanted to, that I kind of really wanted to communicate in the book. Yeah. And I think you do really do that. And just on this question of kind of language and honesty, uh, can we, Ben's mentioned that, like, you know, the boys don't have an honest emotional language with which to talk to each other. But the one language that they do have is banter. Mm -hmm. And banter is a word that makes me cringe whenever I hear the word, like, bant or, like, you know, like, getting on the banter, I just kind of want to die a little. Um, but, like, it is a very common way that, like, guys, particularly young men, talk to each other. You know, like, you've got to keep up the banter. Um, and I found the interactions between the, uh, all the boys in your book to be interesting in terms of their banter and also how thin the line is between banter and outright aggression. Um, how did you approach writing that dynamic in like just kind of the way that they talk to each other and what they're actually saying? It was quite complex. Um, mm. So there was, you know, when you're kind of in that, that space of forming these characters and these voices, I often start by, you know, you, you go on nights out um, and you just listen to the things that people would, would say to each other and you'd make a little mm. mental note was, was kind of some of the things that I started to do as a, as an, as a, 
mm. as a beginning point because you know banter is a very common this it happens a lot between like your your kind of early 20s blokes in university um it's because you know you're still it, it, because there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamics going back and forth and there are it, not, it also was not just about the words that were being spoken, but the little act- interactions that were happening in between. Someone said something at a casino night. You just see that little face, that little look for a moment of someone going, well, I don't like that. Or I think that what you're saying is, is bullshit. Um, and just from that, just kind of observing what was happening. Then I also started to look at what I was doing myself um, mm-hmm. within my interactions, um, within what I was doing. And then from that, the actual characters themselves began to emerge, how those characters would respond in those situations. Um, which, and it was actually one of the funnest parts to write about the book. Um, mm. Just naturally feeling the progression of the, of the characters moving forward. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was very mm. complex, very difficult, but it was a lot of fun yeah. actually. Yeah. It seems like you're really familiar with kind of, Sydney's nightlife and the dynamics of that, but also Sydney itself. Um, I feel like the city of Sydney was a character in its own right. And like, it felt very familiar, you know, walking through like, you know, you kind of talk about like- You go to Frankie's Pizza. That, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Frankie's Pizza, I love. I, I was like, hey, it's Frankie's Pizza. Um, but also just like, you know, the kind of dynamics of, um, like how having a big casino, like if you want a Barangaroo changes Sydney's like geographical landscape, but also its social landscape and how that comes to impact on, you know, people's friendships and the way that they relate to each other. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny. Cause I, my background is actually in, in kind of music journalism. Um, so yeah. I would often, it was, you know, it, to pull from that wasn't also again, not that difficult but for me because I, I go to these places all the time. You'd watch shows mm. at Frankie's pizza. You'd go to, <laughs> to Newtown and you'd, you know, you go to the end more. Um, and the, particularly over the last, with the amount of change that has happened in Sydney over the last four or five years um, around the live music scene, there was the, you know, uh, the lockout laws of a few years back mm-hmm. that were introduced that cr- created a huge shift in dynamic from, you know, everyone suddenly, suddenly King's Cross turned into a bit of a, a ghost town and everyone just moved to, to Newtown. So Newtown became a much more dangerous place. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that, you know, I would be, I would actually as part of that job at, at that time would go and speak to, to owners of, of live venues and talk about some of the crazy ways that they have to, to try and get people through the door um, instead of turning to your your standard pokey, a lot of because a lot of venues actually have, use have pokey machines as their main source of income, um, and then even comparing to how other cities do it. Um, so, as an example, I, in London they have a lock in law at twelve at, at like mm-hmm. ten or eleven o'clock at night, um, but they don't have such relaxed laws around, for example, pokey machines. So there's a real emphasis on those. Uh, on those venues to really push those live events a lot more. And so the music mm. scene thrives as a result. Um, the actual, so the actual space and dynamic of, of going out and of, the, of nightlife, um, particularly as I was watching it change around me uh, in Sydney itself as the book emerged, uh, was, was really interesting, particularly, you know, at, while I was writing that, that process we had that that night where the i think it was the alan jones had the had the had some gambling projected up on the opera house and there was a huge mm-hmm. protest people shined lights all over the opera house to uh to to, be, to say that this public space is not somewhere where you can gamble but yet um i, I see that as a, i see I, I saw that was a very worrying thing that someone would have the audacity to be like hey this this is normal we should do this mm-hmm. it's okay um yeah Hmm. It really represented a, a, a continued degradation of our cultural scene. You know, the Opera House is this international icon hmm. um, of culture um, made good on the other side of the planet for the Europeans that came to this continent and, and, um, and, and made a nation here, um, for better or worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, yeah, there was this 
you know, in this uh, hard landscape and this, um, this uh, you know, what was seen as a very colonial uh, place, we had this beautiful international opera house and it's still an icon, a tourist icon. And now it's a billboard for gambling. It just, it just represented this, like, mm. uh, this, like almost the end of a road of, of cultural degradation of those, you know, what we would refer to as the high arts. Now it's a billboard for a horse race. Uh, that, that, that um, the prevalence of gambling and the, the, commercial weight of it as part of this city uh, really hangs heavy throughout your book, Nick. Um, and I feel like that is just entirely on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the, that whole kind of gambling message, I, <clears throat> I'm really, I find gambling in Australia, like I, you know, I've been to casinos, I've done all of that, uh, but the way that, uh, he, Australians specifically ha- approach gambling. Um, I find very, it's, it's a, it's a very, conf- when you actually stop and think about how they, the, they approach it, it actually becomes quite, I find it really concerning. Like um, the, 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 the relaxed nature of it, the, the <laughs> casual nature of it, of this thing that actually can be extremely damaging. Um, you know, we, again, doing research into this, you'd often see, you know, the, the advertisements that you'd see on Facebook, um, you know, hey, sports bets voting right now, you can, you can go and, and bet and there's these little fun cartoons and stuff. The, doing the marketing research, you realize they're not aiming those at, at, you know, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, they're aiming those at 14 or 15 year olds to kind of really give the sense of, hey, this is normal. This is fine. This is awesome. Um, so gambling was a massive part of this book, but as I was writing it, I also came to the realization um, that as an audience, if you're looking at this as an, purely from the ruthlessness of an audience, if you were to say, Hey, gambling is bad. Uh, you, the audience would probably almost reject that as like you're being pandered to. Um, so mm-hmm. I realized very quickly that I couldn't just say, Hey, gambling is bad. Don't do it because you know, uh, the audience may take it as what, what they may, uh, you have to go deeper. And so that was where the actual, this is where the book really got interesting because you talk about, I had to start thinking about, well, why do people gravitate towards this stuff? Why do people gravitate towards this? And often it's because of escapism and because of getting away from the issues in your own life, um, which is where the mental health aspect then started, started to emerge. Um, but it is a very key part of the story. Uh, I, I want to I get your take on being an author, but being an insider in the book world and, and you know, being a social media guy at Booktopia where we're, we're an engine for new writers. Uh, and so you've, you've got to um, have a, a seat at all these fantastic conversations we've had with incredible talent. Um, and how, how, do you, how do you see yourself in that world? <laughs> that I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's, the, the, it's the, the space is so fascinating. And so many people, I think, I mean, because the first edition of this, you know, I essentially did, you know, through an independent book publisher, but es- like essentially self-publishing. Um, and the, that's, that was an amazing experience and it taught me so much. Um, but the moment that I realized that I, that I landed here um, at Booktopia, you, I realized that a lot of assumptions that, you know, authors have around, you know, particularly first time authors have around the actual publishing landscape. Uh, really, I realized, oh, well, this is going to be, this is something that's a lot more busted complicated. Some myths. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I had some, I had some perceptions changed and, and for the better, in all honesty, you know, it's like a, that mentality of assuming that, that things are all going to be nice and peachy and rosy, but it's a lot of, it, it is a lot of hard work. Um, and incre- but also incredibly enjoyable, um, absolutely worth it. Um, if there are any aspirational authors listening <laughs> in, it is the, the actual, the amount of effort that you, while you, you often many authors think that if you, you publish, you, you write the book, you get it published and that's it. Um, 
which no, it is not. It is only the start of it. And we often have, you know, authors who were in a position where I was last year coming and saying, Hey, I've got this amazing book. Um, please publish it or please promote it or please put it on your channels. And the messaging, the, if, if I have any advice to anyone who is listening is you should always come with the approach of, I have published this book and here's why you should care because you know, it, this is a really big space. This is a huge space um, where things are always changing, always moving. And you know, the one thing that happens with book publishers is you've, you've got to get their attention quickly. Um, and you've got to really show that you that you know your stuff and that this is a book that is worth your time. Um, it, but should you do it still? Should you be terrified? Absolutely. Should you still do it? Absolutely. Because if you have a story in you that is that you can't stop, you've got this thing stuck inside you that you're just burning to say to to tell. Then you are on the right track. If you do it as a if you do it with the, the intention of oh I'm going to make a lot of money this is it's not this is not the career for you. <laughs> it's so interesting hearing this from someone who's had a less conventional by traditional publishing standards path to publication like the, with the self-publishing route and then kind of like to now um and it's it's really valuable to get that perspective i think because you know we do see so many people kind of begging for space and there's such a high premium on like you know attention that we can give books you know like we have to be very strategic in how we like promote books, which books to promote. And like Ben said, we are, we can be a very good engine for emerging writers. And it's nice to hear from someone who is emerging. Um. <laughs> it's the actual space itself. You have to be prepared to project yourself mm. so carefully. You have to be prepared because we are in a very saturated world. Um, and this is not, and this is not just for books. This is for any sort of arts industry. This is for music. This is for, you know, in any sort of space, uh, you, you have to be able to project yourself so carefully. Um, and it, funnily enough, the actual process of kind of framing how this book would, would come together, even down to the look, was actually one of the most enjoyable aspects of, mm. this, of, of redoing this edition because you suddenly have the opportunity to really frame it and focus your vision even not, not just down to the story that you have told, but down to the imagery you're, you're, you're going with, the themes and motifs that you can actually feed into a design. The, um, the way you choose to market it can actually be a huge amount of fun. And mm -hmm. for, any, for a lot of authors out there, if you're doing extra small things on the side, um, that goes such a long way. Um, it's so easy to, to approach a publisher and say, Hey, I have this book. Why aren't you publishing it? <clears throat> um, it's so easy to say that that's easy to do. But if you say, for example, here I am, I have this book. This is what it, this is what it's about. And this is what it covers. I'm also doing this with it. I'm also doing this with it. And I'm also doing this mm. with it. Um, I've already got people who are interested in this book. Um, and this is why I think it should be worth your time is already a much more attractive way of, of you're going to get a lot more attention by doing something like that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, speaking of things that you're doing with this book, <laughs> uh, Nick, tell me about this uh, charity partnership. Yeah. So I'm, I've teamed up with uh, a charity called Livin which is a mental health charity based uh, on the Gold Coast. Um, and so I, how, I, how that came about is I, I play for Dremoyne Rugby Club. Um, <clears throat> and they, we, Dremoyne did a, uh, does a whole bunch of stuff with Livin every year. And I, Livin's basic goal, their goal is to really change the stigma around mental health um, and really kind of make it a lot more approachable and really make it something that is uh, there's stigmas around there that need to be broken around mental health. It needs to be sim something that is seen as relatable and connecting, easy to connect to and an important part of looking after yourself and, and being able to have a healthy relationship with yourself. So they do things like they go to schools and do workshops. They do um, even down to actual, they do branding. So they actually do pieces. They do, um, you know, Piece, like they have shirt ranges, which basically have this hashtag, it ain't weak to speak, really putting that actually visually into, into existence as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the messaging around 
breaking stigma and specifically honesty was really what drove me to them and they've been amazing and it's really and i'm donating 10 percent of my earnings from this book um to that charity because i am of the opinion that kind of again if you're going to talk about these issues we, we are in a space right now you know particularly you know i work within the social media space where it's really easy to just say oh yeah i support that without mm -hmm. actually putting actual action behind it and I'm someone who kind of is of the opinion that if you're going to talk about these subject matters, and if you're going to lend support to these subject matters, you actually have to be prepared to back up your words with action. Um, so if you buy the book, you actually will be in a small way helping there because you're contributing to a charity that does amazing uh, mental health work around in that mental health space. That's terrific. Um, Nick, will you write again? Are you, are you, are you hooked? <laughs> yes <laughs> it's uh it's i i kind of was terrified by the prospect that that putting this book out might actually turn me off the entire process um but it's done the exact opposite because it's now you have a sense of it now you have a feel for it this entire novel for me was just proving to myself that i could actually do it mm. um now that i now know that hey you can do it it's just you and a page. You can, you can write, you can put things down, you can throw things out. If it doesn't work, it's okay. Now it's uh, a matter of getting better um, for me. And I have a, a new story um, on the way, um, which will be set in the country, um, but I'm not going to say anything else, but it'll be a lot more. It'll be a much more, much more personal story for me. Wow. Excellent. Um, Nick, uh, congratulations, first of all, <laughs> if I haven't said that already, uh, this is huge for you. Um, and we look forward to more, uh, you know, you, you've talked about the hard work of, of self promotion. So, uh, we're rolling into Christmas, Nick. So, uh, who is this book for? Who do I, who do I, uh, stow it under the tree for come December? Um, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> That's a really good question. Oh, you've you've stopped, got, you've, yeah, you've, stopped, you, you've, you've caught me off guard there. That's a great question. The book is, is for, it's not just, now many people will make the assumption that the book is just for, you know, it's about men. It's, it's about men's mental health, which is, is not true. Um, it's a book about honesty. Um, and it's a book for, and anyone who has struggled with, the the space of identity and of being honest with yourself um, and with your mental health uh, will be able to will have something to take out of this story. Um, mm -hmm. It's because it, it is it is a story about you know discovering who you are and finding who you are and rediscovering who you are. Um, if that story mm -hmm. appeals to you, that's the one. Then I highly recommend you get it. But then again, I'm biased. I have a biased opinion on this particular book. I encourage you to try it for yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks so much nick for coming on the podcast today it's been um a rare treat to have you usually in the <laughs> producer's chair on mute um actually in the author's chair in the hot seat um we were joking around before we began and you said <laughs> you were about to say all right i'm just gonna mute myself we're recording now so start going wherever <laughs> yeah it's it's been a lot of fun it's and thank you guys for for reading it and and, and taking yeah. a chance on the book because it means a lot particularly you know when you're new and starting out in this industry to have people read this book read this thing that you've this baby that you've been working on and to have it out now in the world is is a is a wonderful thing and it's and I, it means the world to me that you guys uh, enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Look forward to the it's next one. Pleasure. Yeah, keen for the next one. <laughs> if you've been struggling with uh, mental health or gambling or any of the issues that we've been talking about in this podcast, we encourage you to call Lifeline on 13 11 14. So for our lovely listeners at home, you can order your copy of When Men Cry by Nick Wasilia from booktopia.com.au. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free. 
and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.